All right. Um, let's see. Got it. Um, I, to uh, say a little bit more about myself, uh, I my name is uh, Josh Clark. I'm starting my fifth year here at uh, Montgomery Bell Academy. Um, and if we're, pl if we're continuing to play the where did you go to school game, um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree uh, in political philosophy at uh, California State University uh, in Fullerton, which is generally known as baseball school. Uh, I, uh, before coming to MBA, I taught at three schools, uh, Damien High School in Laverne, California, and then I became the director of forensics at Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California, and then I moved to Utah and started a debate program here at, uh, at Juan Diego Catholic High School in Draper, Utah. Um, I, like Brad said, I, am the, I teach modern European history and I'm also uh, the varsity debate coach. Um, but originally I am from Salt Lake City, Utah and, and Brad kind of already uh, spilled it, but whenever I'm outside of Utah and I tell someone I'm from Utah, generally the first question I get, people kind of look down, you know, look around, and they're like, oh, are you Mormon? Uh, <laughs> yes. And <th> <laughs> well, the, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, it really looks nothing uh, like this. Uh, authentic picture of myself would suggest. Um, in reality, uh, like Brad mentioned, um, before the Book of Mormon musical, uh, made it satirically cool uh, to be a Mormon missionary. I served a two-year mission in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, even though I'm no longer uh, practicing uh, Mormon, the time uh, was something that I valued a lot and taught me a lot about uh, interacting with others and uh, uh, having passion for living better lives. Now, this is a, a picture of my actual family. Uh, <laughs> My, my wife, uh, Alexa, works at Conexion Americas, which is a nonprofit organization that seeks to create opportunities for Latino families here in Nashville. My daughter, Jackie, will start kindergarten across the street at Overbrook next week uh, and uh, is actually in the same class as Will McMurray's daughter. So we're I'm really excited about that. The, so Brad asked me uh, to kind of address my journey uh, in terms of teaching uh, and coaching debate. And the topic that I settled on was something that Caroline Schnur brought, or Scholler brought up yesterday, which is um, passion and profession. One of the best parts with starting the year is that we have students, both young and old, who are starting school and looking for new passions to find. It could take the form in a new favorite class that could be anything from German one to multivariable calculus. It could be an extracurricular activity from theater to robotics, or maybe trying a new athletic event. Whatever it is, it represents a fresh start, especially for many of our younger students. What they are looking for is a place on campus and where they can leave a claim in the landscape that is MBA. The way they are first introduced to these new classes and activities is through the conveyed enthusiasm and passion of a new teacher, coach, or instructor. Uh, maybe little Billy didn't know that he would love physics, but Travis Barkley's passion for the subject won him over. To make my point, I wanted to share with you how I found my passion for debate. It's a picture of uh, my mother and me uh, at a BYU football game. Uh, before my junior year of high school, like many other young men that age, I was doing my best to become a professional quarterback. Uh, I stood at a whopping five foot eight and 150 pounds. <laughs> if you can see, things have changed. I actually grew an inch. <laughs> I, was I was taking a beating uh, on the JV squad, and my mom went behind my back and signed me up for a uh, debate class. Uh, I got my schedule and it featured debate and I said, Mom, I'm not going to do that. And she said, just go and try. She says, I think it's something that you'll like. Um, I went to the first day of class, determined not to like the class. And when I arrived, I was met by an enthusiastic debate coach that preached the prospects of winning a state championship, the value of competitive academic activities, and how fun it could be to actually beat someone in an argument. 
With the small size and talent deficiencies that I exhibited in football, I thought this could be uh, my chance to have more success uh, for the rest of my high school career. My mom was correct, like most mothers usually are, and I debated my final two years in high school and then was offered a scholarship to debate at California State University in Fullerton. I snagged the opportunity, was able to tra travel all over the country debating top universities and having a lot of fun doing it. In the process, I also met my future wife at a debate tournament. Um, I sometimes wonder what would have been had I gone to that first day of class uh, and met my, my debate coach and had he not met me with uh, what I call his A-game. Um, had he not exhibited the passion for the activity that day, how radically my life would have changed. As was, I am so grateful to have found that activity and discipline that I could develop a lifelong passion for. Once I graduated, all my intentions were to attend BYU Law School. After all, the school was named after my great uncle, with whom I also share a name. J. Reuben Clark Law School is the name of uh, BYU's institution. But first I decided I would like to take a gap year, and a debate teaching job opened up near where I went to school, uh, and I thought that I would give that a try. It was there that I met uh, my first professional mentor, uh, Chuck Ballingall. Uh, Chuck is the, the large man on the, uh, on the right side of the picture. Uh, and if you see down at the bottom, that's me with some lavish curls. <laughs> I can no longer grow this. Um, Chuck uh, exhibited what uh, Kevin Hamrick dem discussed as fierce dedication to his students. He taught me that teaching and coaching was much more than helping, was much more about helping students than it was trying to win trophies or achieving the highest grades in class. He taught AP Micro and Macroeconomics and served as the director of forensics at Damien High School for 36 years. It was hard to find a week where he didn't have multiple dinners planned with various ex-students who wanted to catch up and hear how him and the team were doing. Seeing that type of relationships he cultivated with his students and debaters is something that always stood out to me. He quickly had me convinced that this was the profession for me and that I would find a fulfilling life teaching and coaching subjects that I was able to be passionate about. Again, I'm not sure what my path would have been in life had I not uh, my, second, my year after college been able to be mentored by Chuck Ballingall. Today, my students have to listen to parts of, the parts of the curriculum that I appreciate more so than others. Each teacher has their favorite subject matters to discuss, whether it be a demonstration of Latin phrases that are still in use today, the intersection between socialism and Christianity, or narrating your day in French. We all have parts of our curriculum we especially enjoy teaching. This enables us to bring up a level of passion for our material we show our students, to try throughout the year to challenge our students with new material and changes. For instance, because my degree in political philosophy, the students know that when we encounter a European philosopher in our textbook, that we are going to celebrate, and I'm going to tell them too much about each of those people. <laughs> Oftentimes, I like to tell them that these lectures are coming days in advance and usually pass out a primary reading from the philosopher to give them a reference point. Whether the person is René Descartes, John Locke, or Friedrich Nietzsche, the students may look forward to or dread the philosophical activity that they have coming up. Some, sometimes this takes the, force, the form of an enlightenment coffee house or an in-class debate about the nature of reality. And some of the students love it, and some of them hate those activities. <laughs> but my hope is that it demonstrates the passion that I have for the material uh, in the classroom, which is something that I think all of us have the opportunity to do. Once we've demonstrated our passion and found students who show mutual interest, it's not sufficient to rest assured that we have a student hooked in our class or activity. The next step is to teach perseverance. On Monday the 21st, the majority of, of us will go through our syllabus with each class and describe to them in great detail what lies ahead. If they expect to master the subject material in our class, then they are expected to work hard to teach to, to learn that material. MBA is known for its high expectations of the boys. The intent behind this is to teach perseverance in hopes that they will work hard and develop both skills and achievement. Brad mentioned yesterday that many of our students have become accustomed to skating by on talent alone, but teaching them the necessity of hard work and effort in the equation is what facilitates skill 
and then achievement. On the top of our squad room door, I posted a University of Michigan football banner in the debate room. Uh, go blue, by the way. The banner is something that I uh, took from Bo Schembechler, and it reads, those who stay will be champions. Its intent is to serve as a reminder during the, all of the hours of hard work and practice that take place that it all can be worth it and is all necessary to teach the debaters to be the very best that they can. It may be difficult, but if they stay and put in the work, it will be worth it. Both in our classrooms and extracurricular activities, we have the opportunity to feed passion of our students by teaching importance of effort in the process, and the effort can be oftentimes be more important than natural talent and that a student has. Now, no presentation by a Mormon speaker would ever be complete without telling a story about the most famous Mormon of all. It's not Mitt Romney, it's Steve Young. <laughs> for those of you who aren't familiar with Steve Young, Steve Young was a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, and he was a two-time uh, NFL MVP and Super, and Super Bowl MVP uh, and had uh, an illustrious career. But before that, he was uh, a quarterback for Brigham Young University. And uh, upon arriving after having a high school career that was full of accolades, uh, he arrived and uh, was, uh, as, as a freshman, placed as the eighth string quarterback. Uh, now in the 80s and 90s, those of us in Utah referred to BYU as a quarterback factory, or a place where a lot of talented quarterbacks went. Um, Jim McMahon was the first string quarterback when Steve Young arrived on campus, who won a Super Bowl with the Chicago Bears. Uh, Steve was delegated to what was called the Hamburger Squad, uh, which was facing, uh, facing the starting defense and second team defense on the scout team. And soon after his freshman year, Coach Lavelle Edwards said that he needed to switch to defensive back. Uh, he called his father, uh, who had been his lifelong uh, teacher and mentor when it came to football, and said, Dad, this is not going the way that I thought. I think this is something that I'd like to step away with. I'd like to move away. Uh, his father, uh, whose nickname was Grit, uh, <laughs> actually taught him, uh, or told him, that he was welcome to move away from football, but that he was not to come home because quitters didn't reside in that house. Well, they, that might be hyperbolic. The, the message was received uh, by Steve, and that was that he'd already put in a lot of hard work and effort in order to gain the skill necessary to achieve, and that more of that effort was what was necessary. Uh, Steve went out in between January and February of that year and threw 10,000 passes uh, into a barrel uh, on the field at BYU, right in front of the new quarterback coach who would watch silently from his office. When Lavelle came back from uh, a month later from traveling, he said, you know, do you still want to move this Steve Young guy to defensive back? And he said, yes, absolutely. He's like, well, will you just see him pass before you do that? And he came down, and he liked what he saw, and he said, well, you can, uh, you can do spring practice. And after spring practice, he moved from eighth string quarterback and being moved to defense to the second string quarterback behind uh, Jim McMahon and then taking over the the uh, starting duties the following year. Um, from, the, from the book that uh, Brad's been talking about, Angela Duckworth uh, in Grit mentioned that passion for your work is a little bit of discovery followed by a lot of development and then a lifetime of deepening. And a lot of that, a lot of us, is, that is where we're at in terms of, of our profession. It's hard to get up uh, and maintain a certain passion uh, every year. And Brad said yesterday that we could have the same year, uh, the same year that we've had copy and paste year after year, or we could try to deepen that passion and find something else. Um, and I think that stands kind of as a challenge uh, for me this year, and hopefully one that stands uh, every year from here on. The last point that I wanted to mention is to teach your students passion and perseverance. Um, a lot of times this is not something that can take on a uh, take on the uh, kind of a one-size-fits-all type curriculum. A lot of this requires us to know our individual students, know what their learning style is, uh, know how their age interacts with what they need, and also what their individual goals are in life. 
Now, to individualize curriculum and work individually with students doesn't mean that we're making it easy for them or giving them the answers. Uh, instead, we're individually challenging them in order to meet their needs, in order for them to develop the, the passion, skill, and achievement necessary to succeed. In order to illustrate this, I wanted to go back to uh, my, first men my first professional mentor, which is Chuck Ballingall. Uh, we had a student together when we were there named Gabe, Gabe Baumgartner. Um, Gabe uh, was socially awkward. Uh, he also had a deep, nasally voice, but he wanted to be a professional sports announcer. And he would go home and he would make tapes at night of him broadcasting baseball games or football games, and he would bring them and ask for us to listen to them during the day. And it was difficult to tell the young man that it was possibly not what his skill set was, uh, was meant for, but we fostered his interest, and even despite some of the the limitations he had, he became a nationally competitive debater for us uh, and was able to make a bond with, um, with Chuck Ballingall. Um, Chuck had a very deep voice and he was the voice of Damien Sports uh, for 36 years and he also was a, a, a fill-in PA announcer for both the Los Angeles Clippers and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so it was a good mentor menteeship that continued um, these past 10 years, and whenever I would get to meet up with both of them, it was a special privilege because of the connection that they had made during that time. Well, Gabe never became a sports announcer. I'm afraid he just didn't have the voice for it. But today he writes for Sports Illustrated, and he puts out articles daily uh, covering anything, everything from uh, college football or his favorite team, the Washington Redskins or Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, to writing great articles about Aaron Judge. Uh, who is awesome. The reason that I chose uh, to talk about <laughs> the reason I chose to talk about passion uh, today it was actually something I changed uh, even just three days ago uh, was because Chuck, Chuck Ballingall, my mentor, uh, passed away two days ago. And uh, you know I, I imagine um, I feel the same way, you know, Kevin and Robbie and many of you did when Billy uh, passed. And um, it's, it was uh, a relationship uh, that meant a lot to me and his passion for debate and for mentoring students above all was something that really stuck out to me and, you know, gave me a goal uh, in profession that really enabled me to, to be here today. That's something that I'll very much always be grateful for. Um, so those of you who were disappointed, and by the last election, I'm guessing uh, there was about a third of you that were disappointed that the most famous Mormon wasn't Mitt Romney. Uh, I'll end with a quote from him. Education is the investment in our, our generation makes in the future. And you know this might go without saying for uh, a room full of educators, but the passion that we bring really has the ability to change lives, and it's something we have the opportunity to do every day. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Josh and I met the other day and to kind of touch base, uh, notes of what we're going to talk about. And um, at the end of the meeting, he, we said, well, who wants to go first? And we kind of looked at each other and Josh said, well, you know, I'm going to go first. And I said, well, great. Yeah, you know, that's fine. Go ahead and go first. After all, he's a, you know, nationally recognized debate coach who has plenty of years of public speaking. What could I, what could possibly go wrong for me? <laughs> well, now I know. So. Um, in an effort to uh, conserve technology, I do not have a PowerPoint, um, but I did try to memorize uh, my speech, and I think I um, um, failed in that attempt, so if you don't mind, I'm going to have to read from my notes. <laughs> Here it goes. I'll start with the prologue. So. <laughs> To some of you, it may seem somewhat pretend, uh, presumptuous of me to stand up here and talk to you on a topic re relating to teaching. After all, I'm only my, uh, starting my 10th year here at MBA, which, relatively speaking, still makes me a rookie. But rest assured that as I scan the faces in this crowd, I am fully aware that they are far more experienced, talented, and yes, Mr. Pruitt, far better looking people than I. 
But since I'm here, I hope that you'll bear with me as I say a few words about what has and continues to inspire me as a teacher with hopes that you may find a nugget or two of inspiration yourself. And if in the process I happen to throw some of you under the bus, please know that it was purely intentional. <laughs> Chapter one, all right. One of my most influential teachers was Mrs. Gonzalez, my honors English teacher in my senior year of high school. She was a demanding teacher who did not take any nonsense, but she also provided a lot of flexibility. Mrs. Gonzalez really wanted her students to enjoy the literature they read. And one of her strategies was for her students to develop some personal connection with their readings and then share that with the class. She would encourage each of us to use our individual talents and interests to help us articulate our understanding of the themes and topics in our readings. For instance, one of my, one of my classmates, an avid cellist, wrote an original musical piece inspired by a scene from Henry V. And she played this piece in class and explained how she felt the piece tied into the plot and themes of this scene. Hearing a soundtrack to Shakespeare's verses and prose gave me a better visual and emotional understanding of his plays. Throughout the year, my classmates and I learned from each other through presentations like these, and collaboratively, we became better readers, listeners, and critical thinkers. Mrs. Gonzalez had the ability to balance two things, high but reasonable expectations and the ability to connect with her students and help them achieve these high standards. She had core goals that she wanted to achieve, but she was also able to adapt her teaching methods and diversify her activities and demonstrate a high degree of flexibility to meet student interests and needs. This fostered an environment in which my fellow classmates and I felt empowered to achieve the challenges set before us. We felt valued and that our teacher knew us for who we were. More importantly, it created a sense of community within the classroom. And all students felt comfortable expressing themselves and learning from each other. And we all wanted to achieve the goals set before us and help others do the same. This is the balance that I now aim to achieve. But it took me a while to figure it out. When I first started teaching Spanish, I largely taught the language the same way that my foreign language teachers had taught me. This meant that we spent most of our time learning grammar and memorizing vocabulary and completing the exercises out of the book, which for the most part required one word responses. We were learning about the language, but not really learning how to use it. But this is the way the books were designed and how many teachers taught. The problem is, this is not the way that I ultimately learned the language. The way I learned was by being in an immersive environment and by engaging with others in a variety of topics. In these conversations, I committed many mistakes with grammar and vocabulary, yet not once was I ever penalized for these mistakes, for communication was established. Yet this is not what I was doing with my students. I was forcing them to memorize vocabulary and verb endings and expecting them to somehow be able to use these to achieve effective communication. And I was penalizing them for anything less than perfection. So I changed my philosophy. Through brainstorming sessions and collaboration with my colleagues, we made it our goal as a program to focus on proficiency. But in order for me to achieve this goal in my classes, I need my students to be constantly engaged in the language. And the trick every year is to create an environment that promotes this constant engagement organically. The best way that I have found for students to want to be engaged is when they feel interested and confident in their abilities. So my first task every year is to get to know my students and to find out what it is that interests them and find ways to pique that interest. The second is to give them the feeling that they can be successful. Howard Gardner identified seven distinct intelli intelligences and hence seven different ways in which, quote, students learn, remember, perform, and understand. Every year I have to know my students and know how they learn and diversify my lesson plans and activities to meet the different learning styles and needs. I also have to grade them fairly. And one thing we have done to help achieve this is to adapt a holistic grading rubric based on the College Board that places value on what students are capable of doing with the language and does not over penalize them for trivial mistakes. For example, in a communicative assessment, students are evaluated primarily on overall topic development, language use, and comprehensibility of their submission, and not on the number of grammatical mistakes they make unless, of course, these impede comprehensibility. In a reading comprehension quiz, a student will be given an authentic reading and have five pretty challenging questions that he has to answer. If he gets one wrong, the score won't be an 80%. For the holistic grading scale, we'll credit his overall understanding, 
rather than penalizing him for that one wrong answer. His grade would be much higher because, after all, four out of five is actually pretty good. This method of evaluating gives credit to those who excel and deserve it, and more importantly, provides room and flexibility for those who still need time to grow. As you may know, I have pretty high standards and expectations in my classes, but ultimately whether or not I am able to reach my goal of getting my students to achieve a certain level of proficiency is determined by how well the group is able to come together as a unit, one in which every student works to improve his ability and that of those around him, and one in which my role is to guide them and to make adjustments and fill the gaps where needed. For this to happen, I need them to believe in me and in their own capability for success. And this is the connection that I seek to achieve. One of my inspirations behind this change in philosophy is the head coach of the University of North Carolina's women's soccer team, Anson Dorrance. He's in the US Soccer Hall of Fame and has won 21 of the 35 NCAA women's soccer championships. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a feat that is second only to Coach Klausner's record as the head coach of the NBA micro soccer team. Is that correct? <laughs> So how has Coach Dorrance uh, achieved the success? In his own words, the secrets to his success are through character development and constructing real connections where, quote, players emotionally play for each other. He makes it his personal priority to understand his athletes and what makes them unique, and he is genuinely intrigued by the different aspects of their personalities. Strategically, he has no magic formula, no system or plays to make this squad champions. He has core values that he aims to achieve. And the game plans and strategies on the field are designed and developed based on the abilities and personalities of the players in any given year. Just like Coach Dorrance, I too want my students to, quote, play for each other emotionally. But I see this goal as one that's not limited to my classroom, for it fosters a character that makes the entire community stronger. At MBA, our core values are clear, gentleman, scholar, athlete. I see examples all around me of how many of us get our boys to understand and embrace these values through making meaningful and positive connections and building a sense of community. Academically, Dr. Carro developed a digital workbook for his physics classes so to facilitate more meaningful interaction between teachers and students and make this challenging course more accessible to our boys. Ms. Ellery had her students travel, traveling to Rome really connect with Roman history by tasking every one of them to research one Roman ruin and then give a presentation to the rest of the group while standing in front of that ruin. She filmed these presentations so that both current and future Latin students could learn from their peers and relate better to this important history. Elijah Reynolds got his freshman students to really feel the theme of disillusionment and all quiet on the Western Front when the excitement for the mock battle for which they spent days preparing disappeared when things turned out to be way different than they had anticipated. Athletically, no one can motivate his players more than Coach Klausner. His positive attitude and putting the focus on what his athletes do right, such as yelling great pass to a player who missed his mark by 20 yards, referring not to the accuracy of the pass, but to the idea and intention behind it, continuously gives his players the confidence and encouragement to keep working hard and to get it right next time. And socially, Dr. Tarkenton spent many lunches in his classroom bonding with a senior over games of cornhole, a senior who really needed this mentorship and friendship. Herr Doherty's humor and constant caring for everyone is always evident, and he too spends many of his free periods mentoring both new teachers and our boys, both those he teaches and many that he does not. And Mark Artisan, for his genuine caring for this community and everyone in it. This is clearly evident through the deep relationships he forges with his peers and students alike, such as spending countless hours in a hospital alongside a student fighting cancer. I could give many more examples, but I'm running out of time, and I can see that some of you are dozing off, and don't worry, I know who you are. <laughs> so I'll end with some final thoughts. In the pre-delta of the Paraná River in northeastern Argentina, you will find a handful of escuelas flotantes, or floating schools. These are single-room schools that are anchored in the river nearby the migrant families that live in that region. There's a single teacher who teaches children from all levels at the same time. Should a flood occur, or the families be displaced for economic reasons, the floating, the floating schools will follow them and anchor by their new dwellings. We read about these schools in my AP Spanish class, and the question I pose to my students is the following. In what ways is the floating school a model that is worth emulating? I feel very privileged to work where I do, and every year I remind myself that we serve a student population that comes from more zip codes than did 10 years ago when I first came to this campus. 
They all have their own unique backgrounds, interests, and ways of learning and understanding. I know that in order for me to be successful, I need to constantly change and adapt to meet their needs. But if I ever doubt my own ability to change, or whether I can change, or excuse me, I can continue to excel through change, I will finish by sharing two quotes that help me remind myself that I can. The first is from Anson Dorrance, again, who said, excellence is mundane, it is accomplished through deliberate actions, ordinary in themselves, performed consistently and carefully, made into habits, compounded together, added up over time. Since it is mundane, it is within reach of everyone, all the time. And the second quote is by a famous philosopher, or, or maybe it was Will Peters, who said, you are at MBA, you can do that. I am at MBA, I can do that, so why not? Thank you.